I was listening to some church leadership stuff this week and some like preaching podcasts, really fun stuff. Um, and, uh, and, um, and they said that you should always introduce yourself at the beginning of your talks, and I realized that I never do that. And so my name is Josh Noblet. 28 years old, um, so that's me, uh, that, that's, that's, that's me, that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm gonna ask if you have your phone out to put it away unless you're taking notes uh, for the next however many minutes we are together, and the only reason I say that is because I love you, and I think God's really good, and I think, I think he maybe wanna, wants to speak to you tonight, but uh, it might be hard for him to get through if you're just stuck in your phone, uh, so I would encourage you to put that away. Anyways, over the past eight months or so, my fitness has begun to deteriorate, okay? And some of you guys don't know about this yet, okay? When I was in high school, I thought it would never happen, okay? But my fitness has begun to deteriorate, it's, it's true. And I've, I've, I've come up with some pretty good justifications as to why that might be. But really, it's just because I don't work out really, and I eat a lot of horrible food. That makes my body feel terrible. Um, Some of you guys, again, you don't know what that feels like. You can eat whatever you want right now, but there will be a day where it catches up to you, so you gotta just be, you gotta be careful. Um, And uh, yeah, it's bad, you know? Like my body at times tells me certain things. It'll be like, Josh, you need to move, you know? And, um, and, uh, And I'm like, I think I'd rather just watch other people's bodies move on the TV, which, Sounded really bad. Sorry. Um, I meant like a basketball game. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna, I wanna watch other athletes run and all of that. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes, sometimes my body's like, Josh, you can't eat that, and my 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 emotions are like, well. Um, I want the double bacon cheeseburger from Culver's for the third time this week. And it's crazy, yes, come on, praise them. Uh, My my emotions always seem to win the day, it's true. My emotions always seem to win the day, and it's not good, Um, it's really not good. I play basketball like once a week up at Oak Bridge City, and it's a lot of fun, and I love it, but I play with some pretty good players, some guys who are in good shape, and so a couple weeks ago I was playing with this, he's a nice guy, but he's annoying because he works out every day. And he's a runner. Um, he likes to run. How many of you guys, anybody like to run? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are the psychos in the room. Uh, I just don't get it. I just don't understand it. Never have, never will, but that's okay. And so he's just prancing around like a deer for an hour and a half. And he's not breathing heavy. And in between games, I'm lying flat on the ground. I mean, I'm just exhausted. I am absolutely exhausted. And kind of subconsciously, I get frustrated with myself and I'm starting to like, honestly, I'm Gaining a little weight for the first time ever. And so I, I, like, right before one of the games started, I raised my shirt up, and I just kind of jiggled it. <laughs> and, and this guy, who I don't know super well, he's younger, he goes, dang, Josh. But he didn't say dang. He's like, dang, Josh. And uh, again, I don't, like, we aren't, like, best buddies or anything. And I'm like, I, t- I told you, I'm out of shape, you know? And that hurt my feelings. And then I went and ate a pizza. <laughs> uh, it's a true story. Um... Yeah, I had another basketball story. I'm going to save you from that, just like I did this morning. And, uh, and, and so not only is, is my fitness deteriorating, but my body's beginning to hurt a little bit, okay? And so my back's been hurting. And it was a few weeks ago, my upper back was really hurting. And so I'm like, I need to go to the chiropractor. So I go to the chiropractor. He says, what's the problem? Where's the focus point? Like, what, what do you want me to do here? I said, it's, 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 it's my upper back. My lower back's great. It's my upper back, and it's the right side of my upper back. And so... He adjusts me and afterwards I'm like, how was it? And he said, well, your lower back structurally is way worse than your upper back, which I just told him was not the case. And then he said, the left part of your upper back is way worse than the right part of your upper back, which was just kind of funny. And the reason I share that story uh, is that what I thought was the main problem, what I thought was the main priority really wasn't the main priority. And I think that's what we're gonna see in our passage of scripture today, uh, that what these onlookers and, and what these, these people who are in attendance at this particular scene with Jesus, they kind of missed the point. What they thought was the main priority wasn't really the main priority. And I think it points to us as human beings, whether we're Christians in the room or not Christians in the room, that at times what we think is the main priority in our lives and maybe in the lives of those around us, well, it's just not. It's just maybe not as important as we think it is. And so we're going to look at Mark chapter 2, and we're just going to kind of sit there uh, for the next 25 or so minutes, and I'm really excited about it. I actually kind of gave this message 
this morning at Oak Bridge City and they were really responsive. They yelled back a lot. They, they got excited. They, they were engaged. And so you guys are going to do that too. It's going to be really good. The front row is going to go crazy. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be, uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, <laughs> she, they were zoned out. They were like, you didn't even hear me. Uh, but yeah, so I, uh, I'm excited. And in order to understand Mark chapter two, we have to go to Mark chapter one, where Jesus kind of comes onto the scene as the miracle man. He's kind of taking the world by storm. He's healing the magnitudes and the multitudes. He's announcing a brand new kingdom that's available, that's at hand. He looks at leprosy and says, come off this man, and it does. Tells a fever to break, and it does. And again, he has this extraordinary new message that some people really liked and other people were really disturbed by, which leads us to Mark chapter two. A few days later, after all these miracles, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left. Think about this scene. Try and go there with me for the next few moments. There was no room in the house where Jesus is teaching, not even outside the door. There are so many people where he was preaching the word to them. And some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And since they couldn't get him to Jesus through the crowds, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat that the man was lying on. It's a pretty cool story, okay? And so Jesus is teaching, there are so many people here and these four friends have kind of a bold move of faith and they're like, we're gonna get this guy in the presence of Jesus. And I've preached this passage before and I've heard other preachers preach this passage before and I've studied this passage where a lot of people are, you know, they focus on the friends. And it's good for preachers that like to yell and are a little bit hyper, and at times that's me. And so we get up on stage and we're like, you need to get four good friends who can carry you and you can't carry yourself. You know, you need to get four good, faith-filled friends who will bring you into the presence of Jesus and nothing's going to stop them. Come on, somebody, you a faith-filled friend. And then the edge would go crazy. It would be awesome. But, but really, this passage, at least the main point, isn't about the friends. It's not. And again, it's a, cool, it's a cool moment. It's a great moment. It's a moment of faith. Jesus loves this moment. It's beautiful. It, I used to think it was way cooler than I do now. It's still really cool. But I used to think, again, like in 21st century, in order to get on a roof, you have to like climb a ladder or go up a wall. And so I used to think that these dudes were like superhuman, scaling a wall with one hand while holding a paralyzed man in the other hand. But most likely in this time period, the homes just had stairs that would get you up to the roof that served as a balcony from time to time. And the, the roof would have been, it was like a clay thatch, so it would have been made of clay and, and mud and hay was involved. It was kind of dirty. And, and, and so, so the friends make a pretty bold move. They break open the roof. This guy is in the presence of Jesus. But again, the main point of the passage isn't the friends. In fact, the main point of the passage isn't even that the man gets unparalyzed. Sorry, spoiler alert. Eventually he gets unparalyzed. But that's not the main purpose of the passage, which is kind of where the story takes a pretty interesting turn. <laughs> because if you were watching this scene, go there with me. This is cool. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're not a Christian. This is a cool, this is a cool story. Okay, these guys bring a paralyzed man in the presence of a guy who, who at least they've at least heard that he does miracles. And everyone knows the main priority here. Everyone knows the point. Everyone knows the purpose. Everyone knows the problem. The problem is that he's paralyzed and the purpose is that he wants to get unparalyzed. That's the issue. And so Jesus is looking at this paralyzed man who is clearly <laughs> overtly paralyzed and he would have been suffering because of it, especially in this time period. And then Jesus saw their faith and he says, you're forgiven. To which the man who's paralyzed is probably thinking, oh, yeah, about that, um, I, I, I didn't come for, for that, I'm, I'm paralyzed. 
the onlookers would have been like, what, you know, what? That's what my niece does when I tell her something that she doesn't want me to tell her, or if I tell her no, she'll just be like, what? She'll act like I don't hear her, you know? And that's what these people are thinking. They're, what? No, 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 no. He came to be unparalyzed. He didn't come to be forgiven. And Jesus, besides, how can you, you can't even do that. The religious leaders literally start thinking to themselves, why does this guy talk like that? Mark 2, 6, 7, he's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? <laughs> Which leads us to a side note here, okay? Jesus, in this passage that we just read, this miracle man takes it a step further, and in this passage he claims to be God. He knows in this system that only God can forgive sins, and so Jesus looks at this man, hey, you're forgiven. People are like, says who? And Jesus says, says me. And then the people are like, only God can do that. And then Jesus is like, do the math. He's either God or he's not. And this is so important. As a middle schooler, as a high schooler who comes to church, you guys need to know what we believe about this. Jesus is either God or he's not. We believe he's God. And if he's God, he's the one true God as he claims to be over and over and over and over again, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And for some of us in the room, maybe, maybe it hasn't hit you yet, but there's a temptation in some Christian circles in today's day and age to be like, well, I think Jesus is God, but to say he's the only God and the only way, that's, well, that's not super popular. So we don't really talk about that. You know, like, like there's something going on in our culture where we just kind of deconstruct the original version of Christianity and we reconstruct a version of Christianity that is more appetizing to culture and people who are opposed to God to begin with. And so we don't talk about how Jesus is king. We don't talk about how Jesus is Lord. We don't talk about how Jesus has the power to save people from their sins because we don't really like to talk about sin. That's kind of controversial. That's a little bit difficult. That's hard to swallow. And so we don't really say stuff like that. We just kind of are like, well, Jesus can make your life better, which I think is true to some extent, but his followers were all killed because of their belief in him. <laughs> and so if you only come to Jesus because he's gonna make your life better, that's probably not a good ground to stand on, whether you're in middle school or high school, because at the time life could just sucks. And so, so he's either God or he's not. And what I want to say to you if you're in middle school or in high school, if we strip Christianity of that reality, if your version of Christianity is a version where it's like, well, I don't really, Jesus just kind of works for me and maybe someone else will work for you. If we strip Christianity of the reality that Jesus is the only way to God, that he is the only way of salvation, then we strip Christianity of its power. We do. And so in middle school and in high school, and especially when you guys get to college, you, you don't need to be ashamed of what you believe in. You, you don't need to buy into the lie that this gospel is bad news. <laughs> it's, it's really good news. And Paul says, because it's really good news, I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God that brings salvation to all who believe. Okay, so back to the story. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder if when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, if people start thinking to themselves, has he gone crazy? Like, clearly this guy isn't here to be forgiven. Has he just totally missed the point? Which leads to a pretty fascinating question. Has Jesus missed the point on what's most important here? Or have we missed the point on what's most important? Is Jesus' priority system out of whack? Or is our priority system out of whack? To which all of us are like, you know, we're in church. Of course, Jesus is perfect, ours is, stupid question, on to the next. But think about it. How many of us like the paralyzed man? Get real with me for a moment. Y'all can put your phones away again if you're on them. <laughs> uh, how, how many of us like the paralyzed man have something that we would say we really need to change. It needs to change. How many of us have an issue that might not be as heavy as being paralyzed in the first century, which was horrible, but how many of us are like, no, there's something that I really want 
There's something that I really need. There's a situation in my life that is really, really difficult and you've brought it before Jesus and you want it to change. Like my parents aren't getting along and I, it, it, it feels like it's a really bad situation at home. There's relational dynamics, there's anxiety, there's depression, there are these different things. Maybe there's a health report in your family that you wanna change, maybe, or maybe you're just, yeah, like the friends, and there's, it's not necessarily in your life, but there's something in one of your friends' lives or your family members' lives where you're like, this just needs to change, right? Like, my parents need to get, like, they, they've been out of a job for a long time. We, we need some financial, so whatever it is. Could be massive. Maybe you're like, it's not that, but, but what are you hoping for? What tangible, literal thing do you have before Jesus? And think about this. How, how if we're being honest, if we're being honest, how obnoxious would it be? How borderline frustrating would it be if Jesus looks at that thing that thing that you've brought to him over and over and over again, and he just says, you're forgiven. Right? If we're being honest, for some of us, what's most important, the main priority in our lives isn't the unseen realities in our world that Jesus can forgive sins and seal eternal destinies, but rather it's what's seen and it's what's visible and it's what's tangible. Maybe there are certain narratives in the world that are going on. And you're like, that's the main priority. Maybe it's a cultural issue or maybe it's just a personal issue. And because God hasn't answered the personal issue in the way that you wish that he would answer the personal issue, you're like, I can't trust him. I don't want to trust him. So I'll go to the edge every now and then, but I'm probably not going to sing. I, I just, there's just too much junk going on in the world. I don't know if I can actually trust him. And maybe you're in a funk because of the reality that Jesus hasn't done with what you've put in front of him what, what exactly you want him to do with it. And I think the solution for that, the solution for that is not easy, okay? So this is gonna sound churchy and cliche. It's not easy, but it's a fairly simple formula. You gotta take your eyes off of what you don't have you got to take your eyes off of the situation that you've put in front of Jesus over and over and over again. You got to quit fixating on it and you got to say, okay, I don't have that. But what I do have is security that I'm forgiven and freed and valued and loved and cared for. And I'm yours forever and ever without end. Paul talks about this a whole lot throughout the New Testament. You don't fix your eyes on what is seen but on what is unseen. And as you do that, as you begin to see the world the way that Jesus sees the world and the way that he wants you to see the world, things begin to, to, to shift. There was a, a story uh, of a woman named Lois Evans who died. Um, and she was a, a, a kind of a world-renowned pastor's wife. And, uh, and, and talk about a want, okay? Like talk about a want, talk about a need. These kids, their mom was dying cancer. They're praying that she would be healed. That's a want. That's a need before Jesus, right? You have a husband who's praying for healing. Talk about a want. This is heavy stuff, but she dies, and they're all Christians, and at the, at the funeral, her, her son does a eulogy, and he says that in the midst of all this, he was angry at God. He was frustrated. He was wrestling with God. He's like, I thought we had the victory. How could this possibly happen? How could this take place? And he said that in a moment of prayer, God spoke to him and said, clearly you just don't really understand my victory. Because of what I've done, because of my forgiveness, there were really only two answers to your prayers. Either she was gonna be healed or she was gonna be healed. Either she was gonna be well taken care of or she was gonna be well taken care of. Either she was gonna live or she was gonna live. He said, because of what Jesus has done for us and the forgiveness of God, that's been ushered into our lives, the only answers in the kingdom of God for this particular situation were yes and yes. And, and, uh, and I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you might even be like, you know, you're like, okay, this is too much, right? Like maybe you're not a Christian and you're like, how could he say that? How could he say that his mom, his, his mom was dying? His mom died. 
How could he say that? This sounds like it's a fantasy, it's a fable, it's a superstitious story that can make you feel good as a crutch when somebody dies or when tragedy strikes. How could he say that? I would disagree with that and I would just say, he could say that because he knows what's most important. He, he believes that Jesus literally died in a real time, in a real place, to pay for the sins of the world just as predicted. And then he believes a couple days later, Jesus literally rose from a real tomb in a real time, in a real place, proving that what he says is true. And what he says is if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus, that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, you'll be forgiven. It's signed, sealed, delivered forever. And if that's the case, if that's the case, I get it. It's easy to come in and be like, oh, yeah, I heard it before. But if Jesus died and rose again and offers forgiveness to anyone who believes in him, maybe just maybe our priority system is out of whack. Okay, back to the story. Jesus says you're forgiven. Go there with me. Jesus says you're forgiven. And we just read it. The religious leaders are like, he just said he forgave sins. Thinking this, this isn't good. We have a problem on our hands. Only God can do that. This is an issue. What are we going to do? And then Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were saying. And he's like, y'all got a problem? It's my translation, but essentially that's what he says. Like, you got a problem? Why are you thinking these things? What's going on? And then the religious leaders are just like, don't say anything. Thank you. I thought that was funny too, Olivia. I thought that was good. <laughs> You're the best. You're amazing. Um, right? But they don't say anything. And then Jesus drops the bomb and he asks a really important question. This is really, I think it kind of is the climax of the passage. He says, which is easier? Think about this, student. Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. And in this particular time period, there's been debate over the centuries as to which is easier. But in this time period, all the religious leaders who were thinking to themselves, I can't believe Jesus is doing this. They would have known the answer to this question. It's much more weighty. It's much more difficult to forgive sins. They knew the weight and the gravity of sin and the punishment of our, of, of our sins. And so Jesus is essentially asking a rhetorical question. They all would have known, well, we've seen miracles throughout the history of Israel and it's probably a little easier to tell someone to get up and walk than it is to forgive someone's sins and alter their eternal destiny. And Jesus says, yeah, with that in mind, I want you to know that I have the authority to forgive sins. And so he says to the man, he says to the man, get up, take your mat, walk, just go home. Tell your, tell your mom and dad I said hi. Think about how casual it is. He's like, I tell you, get up, take your mat, walk, go home. And immediately he does he gets up, walks out in full view of them. Everyone's amazed, praising God. We've never seen anything like that. Think about the healing. Think about this miracle, which it is. Think about the sign and the wonder, which it is. It's an extraordinary story. This guy who, who, who has atrophy, he's paralyzed, he can't move. He's healed instantly and fully. It's a beautiful story. But Jesus says, he just said it. These aren't my words, these are his words. He says, the reason I did that, the reason I healed the man is so that you would, you would be brought back to the reality that I can forgive sins. Students at the edge, we'll pray for the, we'll pray for the sign and we'll pray for the wonder. wonder. We'll, we'll, we'll pray for the healing of someone who's sick in your life and we'll pray that the anxiety would leave and we'll, we'll pray that you'll you know, grow and all these different things. We'll, we'll pray for the signs and for the wonders. We'll pray for the wants and for the needs as we should. Jesus says, bring those to him. But make no mistake about it, even if those things don't play out the way that we want them to play out, we have all the miracle we need in the reality that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we're gonna talk about different things here at The Edge and we're gonna talk about social media because it's important and we're gonna talk about dating and friendships and relationships because those things are important, but make no mistake about it, the main priority here at The Edge is gonna be 
<laughs> bringing you back to the reality that Jesus can forgive you of your sins and change your life, not just now, but forever. So he heals the man, and maybe, think about this, maybe the nature of his healing points to the nature of Jesus' forgiveness. That'd be pretty wild, wouldn't it be? Jesus says, the reason I'm gonna heal this man is so that you would know I have authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he says, get up, take your mat, and walk. And notice he didn't say, hey, you can walk, but you're gonna have to go to physical therapy for a little while. You're gonna have to figure it out. No, it's, it's final. It's immediate. It's complete. He's healed. Which, let's ask the question, what did this man do to deserve the healing? What did he do? What did he do? He uh, broke a roof. He uh, interrupted a speech. But he did it in desperation. And he did it with faith. And in a moment of desperation and in a moment of faith, Jesus says you're healed completely. And this is the nature of God's forgiveness that could be ushered into your life or maybe it already has been ushered into your life. You can't deserve it. You don't deserve it. You never will. But in a moment of desperation and in a moment of faith, Jesus could say, as you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he can look at you and say, you are forgiven. And it's not a gradual forgiveness. It's not like, well, I gotta walk really, really straight for a while, and then I'm gonna be forgiven. No, that doesn't make any sense. That's, it's, that would be works-based, and it's not. He says, he says, your forgiveness is complete, and it's final. Think about that. Think of the beautiful, radical nature of what God maybe wants to do in your life. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, in fact, the whole entire scene points to what God wants to do in your life. Go, go there with me. Think about this for a moment, okay? Jesus is in the middle of this house. And again, these roofs would have been made up of clay and mud and, and, and it was just dirty. And, and, and so they, they start they break open the roof. And so I brought some dirt, uh, brought some dirt from Capernaum. Um, kidding, it's dirt from Oak Bridge City. Um, but, uh, you know, like we start doing that. Let's start doing that here. This is, uh, this is dirt from the place where Jesus actually healed that man. Uh, this is miracle dirt, thirty nine ninety nine, out in the lobby. Uh, you touch this dirt, your life will be changed forever. Uh, I'm just kidding, but that's actually a thing. People do that. Anyways, um, so there's dirt. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's dirt here in this scene, and Jesus is standing in the middle of it. it it's messy. We like to civilize these stories. We like, to, we like to polish them up and make them cute. We're like, this is so cool. This is so awesome. It would have probably been pretty annoying if you were there. The roof's breaking open. The roof's breaking open, everyone's getting dusty and dirty. If I'm the preacher, if I'm the one telling the stories, I would have been like, yo, hold on, hold on. I'll just come to you. I'll come to you. You're making a mess, getting dirty. But I want you to, I want you to just see Jesus in this scene. There's dust and there's dirt and it's falling all over him, like all over him. And it's messy. And, and again, if it's me, if it's a normal guy, I'd be like, hey, yo, chill. I'll come up there. Like, people might be annoyed watching this. Like, you're interrupting our religious experience. You are. We're listening to the miracle man, and you're interrupting it. So there's dust, and there's dirt that's falling from the roof, and, uh, and the scripture says that Jesus marvels. He's in awe. In fact, he, he's, probably, he's probably smiling. He was in awe, and he's like, I like these guys. I like these guys. They're in the middle of the dust and the dirt, in the middle of the mess. I mean, right in the middle of it. Jesus says, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. Maybe you've 
bought into the lie that you got to clean yourself up before you can bring yourself into the presence of Jesus to where he can heal you and free you and forgive you. You know, we just did a love, sex, and dating series, and, and, and maybe, maybe you, you've bought into the lie that, you know what, well, I got to get over this habit first, and then I can come to Jesus. I got to clean up my dating life first, and then I can be forgiven by God. No, 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 that's, that's, uh, that's not the message at all. Maybe you grew up in church, or maybe at times the evil one twists our words here, and you begin to think, I got to look a certain way, and act a certain way, and talk a certain way, and learn the lingo before Jesus would ever love me, and accept me, and welcome me into his family. I just got to clean it up, and so before the edge, you're like, I just got to clean it up a little bit. I'm not going to go because it's dirty, and so when you do come, you're like, I got I to gotta clean it up, I got to clean it up, I got to gotta clean it up. Jesus isn't going to, Jesus isn't going to meet me there. But that's, that's not really the Jesus that we see throughout the Gospels, especially in this account. We see a Jesus who welcomes children, the least of these, those who are outcasted, marginalized in society. Jesus meets those people right where they are. Jesus is a friend of sinners. He loves the tax collector. He, uh, he, uh, he, he brings dignity to the prostitute and the adulterer. And he forgives them. He meets them right where they are. And he offers them a brand new life. Jesus says, I didn't come for the people who think they have it all together. I came for the sick. I came for people who made a mess. Which, which lets us know, if, maybe if you have a mess on your hands. And you have an addiction on your hands. And you have sin that's going on in your life and there's just dust and dirt everywhere and it's foggy and it's hard to get out. Jesus says, I came for you. The message is, it's not, hey, don't drink, don't smoke, don't cuss, don't, don't, do, don't do silly things, learn the lingo and then maybe you can come. No, the message is, 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 is come through the roof. Bring the mess, bring the dust, bring the dirt. And Jesus says, I'll meet you right there. Right there. And uh, I don't think the devil wants you to believe this. Sorry if you think that's weird, but it's true. I think shame tells you that this is too good to be true. And some of you are like, you don't know the mess. You don't know the mess. You don't know the pain. You don't know the sin. You don't know the shame. You don't know the habit. You don't know the mess. You don't know the mess that I have made. There's no way that Jesus is going to meet me in it. There's no way Jesus is standing or he, there's no way he wants to stand in the mess. Yeah. Uh, It gets even better than that. It gets even better than Jesus standing in the mess. In fact, Scripture says that Jesus wore it. He, he took it upon himself. He, he took it upon his, his own shoulders. Scripture teaches that on the cross, he doesn't just stand in the mess. He says, I'll literally wear it. I'll put it on my shoulders. I'll pay for it. Some of you are like, no, no, no. I got I to gotta, I gotta make this right. I got to make the mess right. I got I to gotta pay for it. And Jesus is like, yeah, um, uh, I already did that. I already did that. My blood was shed, I was beaten and battered and scarred. It was the messiest situation in all of human history because I wore the mess and the sin and the shame of every single person who's ever walked the face of the earth so that you could be forgiven. No, you don't need to pay for it, it's already been paid. Kind of regretting doing that. But I want you to think about this visual, Jesus. Jesus wears it tonight. Whatever you're ashamed of, Jesus says, yeah, 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 I paid, I paid for that. That was, that was on me. That was, that was, that was, I, I, I took that upon myself. 
And so I just want to give you a moment, um, two different groups of people a moment, actually. And we're just going to close our eyes uh, for concentration, if you will. And uh, if you're a person who claims to be a Christian in the room, who claims to be a Jesus follower in the room, um, I want you to begin to think, are my priorities out of whack? Is what I've begun to think is most important, not really what's most important? Have I become so fixated on what I lack and what I don't have and of tangible, visible circumstances in life that I've forgotten about the unseen reality that Jesus wants to forgive people of their sins? Or Jesus has already forgiven me of mine? Take a moment. Think about where your heart is. Think about where your priority system is. Think about where your allegiance lies tonight. for the middle school or for the high school or for the leader, for myself at times. Maybe for all of us at times. Maybe for some of us right now in this moment. Maybe all of us to some extent right now in this moment need to just say sorry. God, we're sorry. We confess, we repent. There have been secondary issues. There have been secondary narratives that we've latched onto and focused on and we've lost sight of the urgency and the importance and the priority that you give to salvation and forgiveness of sins and for people stepping into a brand new life. God, for some of us, there's pain and there's wants and there's needs and it's choked out our faith. And it's caused us to buy into the lie that maybe you're not a good God. And Father, we know we've seen it time and time again in our lives that that's it's not the case. And Lord, all the proof that we need is in the cross. And uh, so God, we take our eyes right now off of our own circumstances and on to the reality that You died for us and you forgave us of our sins. And Lord, that's enough. It's more than enough. But because you're a really good God, you give us a whole lot more than that. And we praise you for it. We thank you for it. And uh, if you're not a Christian in the room, uh, if you're not a believer in the room, I just want you to reflect on the message that we've just heard the reality that god's not a god's not afraid of the mess god's not scared of the junk and maybe god wants to meet you right where you are in the moment that you simply confess with your mouth that jesus is who he says he is that god raised him from the dead that he died for you that he loves you that he's powerful enough to give you a brand new life that moment can usher in a brand new reality into your life that you're forgiven forever, that you're freed from not only the the penalty of your sin, but the power of your sin. And you can walk in freedom and victory, life where we become more and more like Christ. Your life could be changed forever in a moment just like this. And so maybe you've heard the story a whole lot. Maybe you've gone to camp. Maybe you've come to the edge. Maybe you've gone to other churches and you're here tonight and you've You've never made the decision to actually say, yeah, I'm going to believe. I'm going to step over the line and say, you know what, I'm in. I'm going to trust God. If that's you, maybe if you feel led, if you've looked at this story and if you intellectually agree that Jesus is who he says he is, maybe for you right now is your moment.
Father, I pray for some of us right now in this, in this room to take a step, to say I'm gonna trust you for the first time ever. I'm gonna give you my whole life because you're worthy of it, because you love me, because you died. Because you're powerful, because you're good, and because the life I'm living on my own just doesn't work, which it doesn't. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're a believer in the room of this message that Jesus meets you in dust and in dirt, uh, the song that we're about to sing is a beautiful song. It's a beautiful anthem that I would encourage everyone to stand up and sing along with. Why don't we stand and go to God in worship?